The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Thank you for changing the world. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm going to start a brand new series, and before I tell you what it's about, I need to say something here, and this is that the title, what I'm going to discuss, is going to turn off a lot of people. A lot of you are going to think that this isn't important, and yet I just want to preface this by saying that this is something that God spoke to me over four decades ago. I have been implementing this to the best of my ability. It has been developing and, and evolving, and just in the last year, actually all during this year of 2010, the Lord has just been emphasizing on me that this is really one of the most important things that He's ever shown me. I've mentioned this. I've talked about it in the past, but I haven't made a major deal out of it. And so I've been praying about this, and for about the last seven, eight months, I've been really just meditating on this and developing this. And so I preface all of these things by saying that I really believe that this is one of the most important things that I can share with you. And even though many of you are not going to immediately identify with this, I just encourage you to listen and give me an opportunity because this is going to make a huge difference in your personal life. It's going to answer a lot of questions for you. And one of the major benefits, I believe, of this is it's going to make you a hundred times more effective in your ministry to other people. It's going to change a lot of things. I believe it will also give you a lot of understanding about why the body of Christ is ineffective in many ways. You know, one of the problems that uh, has disturbed me is that if we have so many people who are claiming the name of the Lord, then why aren't we seeing our nation go in a godly direction? It seems like it's marching in exactly the opposite direction. And, of course, that same principle, that same type of thing applies in, uh, you know, families and just on many different levels. And I believe that this teaching that I'm going to do is going to answer a lot of questions, and it's going to really give you a focus. I think it's going to clarify things. It's like if you're looking at a puzzle and, you know, you just can't fit the pieces together. This is going to make a lot of things fit together, and it's really going to be beneficial to you. So I say all of these things in advance of telling you what the subject is just so that you won't turn me off, so that you won't say, oh, well, I don't need that, or that doesn't sound interesting to me. But what I'm going to be talking about is discipleship, and I'm going to be specifically contrasting discipleship with the way that evangelism has typically been done in the body of Christ. And one of the major points that I hope to accomplish through this series is to show that if the emphasis was on discipleship, we would actually evangelize people better through discipleship evangelism than we would through the way that evangelism is being done. Now, as I said at the beginning, many of you, that just doesn't seem to ring a bell to you. Many of you are thinking, these are things that don't apply to me. I'm aware that a lot of people, when they flip the dial, they're just looking for something that will help them in the crisis situation that they're in that moment. They want some teaching on healing. They want teaching on finances. They want teaching on relationships. And they're just looking for a quick fix. And when you start talking about some of these foundational things, and especially something called discipleship, most people just have a disconnect and don't see the importance of it. But again, I'm asking you, if you have been blessed by any of the teaching that I've done, if God has spoken to you through this, then I'm asking you just to take my word for this, that this is very important. This is something that you need to understand. A lack of understanding this is really one of the big problems why people aren't experiencing healing and prosperity and deliverance and relationships. It's why the church is not making the impact on our society that God intended for us to. And the Lord has just, like I said, 40 years ago, he showed me some of these things, and this has influenced everything I've been doing. This is why I became a teacher. 
uh, of course, God called me to this, but this is how he revealed that to me and showed me the importance of teaching is because of these principles. I'm going to be talking about discipleship. It's provided direction for me for over four decades. And as I've been in the ministry now for 43 years, I just believe that the Lord is speaking to me that this is really so important, that this is something I want to devote the rest of my life to. I've done it already for the last four decades. I've been trying to emphasize and disciple people, but it's just increased. Uh, when we started our Bible college in 1994, of course, that was a major increase in the way that we're trying to disciple people. And uh, I've had a meeting with my staff, and we've talked about that we just need to take all of the teachings that I've got, organize them, put them into series so that it will be easy for people. Like if you have a need in healing, that you'll be able to take our materials and just step one through ten or whatever, get all of the things that the Lord has shown me on healing. If it's prosperity, we can put all of these things together. If it's in marriage or in relationships, we're going to start organizing everything. And, and our whole ministry is just going to be focused on trying to disciple people and bringing them to a place to where they can appropriate the power of God for themselves. You know, I'll make this point in much more detail as we go through, but the body of Christ as a whole does not have this discipleship mentality. What we have is we have certain people, such as pastors, our evangelists, our ministers, television ministers, radio ministers, and we believe that those people are called and anointed by God, that they have a special anointing on them. And basically, the body of Christ is depending upon these ministry gifts for God to funnel all of his power and his anointing into them. For instance, and there's many applications, but one application is in the area of healing. A lot of people really do not know how to believe God and receive the healing power that God has made available to every one of us. It's God's will that every single person be well. Not a single person is supposed to be sick. Christian, non-Christian, he's already paid for the sicknesses and the diseases of the entire world. It is never God who fails to heal. And yet the vast majority of Christians are not experiencing healing, not because God hasn't provided, but because they don't know how to receive. And one of the reasons that they aren't receiving is because they haven't been discipled. They haven't reached a place of maturity where they could reach out and take their healing. Like if you're familiar with any of the healing scriptures in the Gospels, there were people that asked Jesus to minister to them, and Jesus had to go and pray for them. There's other people like the centurion in the 8th chapter of the book of Matthew that he mentioned to Jesus that his servant was sick, and Jesus started to come, and he says, I don't need you to come into my house. He says, I'm a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. If I tell somebody to go, they go. If I tell them to come, they come. And I recognize the authority in your word. You speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus was shocked. It says he was amazed at this man's faith. And he says, I've never seen such great faith in all of the nation of Israel. This man wasn't even a Jew. He wasn't what we would term it today. He wasn't in the church. He wasn't a religious person. He was outside of the church. He wasn't even considered one of the religious people. And yet he had such faith that it amazed the Lord. And the Lord says, because of your faith, so be it done unto you. And there's other people. The woman with the issue of blood in the fifth chapter of the book of Mark did the same thing. There was people that could reach out and touch Jesus, and the power of God would instantly flow because they had developed, their faith was at a level that Jesus would turn around and say, so be it done unto you according to your faith. There's other people that came like the man that had the um, son who was uh, demon-possessed and had some type of seizures. And he says, Lord, if you can do anything, have mercy on me and heal my son. And the Lord said, I, you know, it's not a matter of if I can do anything. It's if you can believe. And he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So he had a degree of faith, but he was struggling. And so the Lord had to help him. He didn't tell that man, uh, uh, according to your faith, so be it done unto you. No, he had to step in and put his faith on the line to get his son healed. And what I'm saying is that there, today there are very, very few people who have developed in their relationship with the Lord to the degree that they can reach out and take their healing. 
And so they have to depend upon people who have special anointings on their life, people who have the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, and they run to their meetings. And again, I'm not saying that that's wrong. You know, we have to start someplace, but I'm saying it's wrong for the body of Christ to never progress past that. Let me start with a scripture over here in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is talking about that God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and uh, teachers. That's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Let me just read this to you so I don't get it wrong. It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. This is talking about that when he ascended on high, he led all of the people who had been in paradise or in Abraham's bosom. Uh, he led them into heaven, and he gave gifts unto man, and it lists these gifts of an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And then it says in the next verse, here is there why he gave these. He says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And it goes on and talks about this. But the point I'm making is he gave these gifts, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, so that the saints, the regular rank-and-file member of the body of Christ, Joe Blow, Jane Doe Christian, could become a disciple, could become mature, and then they do the work of the ministry. Now, some of you may not have ever looked at this verse in this light, but I want you to read this again. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. He gave these gifts to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. The way I'm interpreting this and believing it is that you perfect the saints and then the saints do the work of the ministry. You know, I believe that it is inefficient. This is one of the points that I'm going to be making, and I'm going to be showing you a lot of stats, and I'm going to be proving this, uh, I believe, conclusively, that the way that the body of Christ is set up to where we have the clergy and the laity, these people that are anointed and called by God, and we depend upon them to go out and get the people born again. We, in, we depend upon them to go to the hospitals and make the calls, to pray for the sick, to see the sick heal. We depend upon them to be the spokesman for the body of Christ. I believe that that is absolutely wrong, and it is super inefficient. One person is not going to be near as efficient as if we had hundreds of people in that congregation that were mature and able to go out and into the hospitals and minister to the people at work. You know, you can say it this way. The scripture says over in, uh, I believe it's 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter was talking about that he was a shepherd. He was called to be a shepherd. And the pastor of a church is called a shepherd. Did you know shepherd don't have sheep? Shepherd tend sheep. And as they feed the sheep and protect them and take care of them, sheep have sheep. Amen. We have been depending upon the shepherd to have sheep, the shepherd to produce all of the new births, for the shepherd to be the one who is getting all of the people into the kingdom and doing all of these things. No, the job of a pastor is to shepherd the sheep to mature the body of Christ and bring them to a place to where they can do the work of the ministry. And if that was the way we were doing it, instead of having one person who is out there as the point man and is, is leading people to the Lord and doing this, we would have hundreds, maybe thousands of people that were going into every, every area of their community and they would be impacting people. And I tell you, it would be much more efficient. But again, the body of Christ has not got this concept of discipleship. They do not see themselves as being disciples. Matter of fact, you know, if you talk to the average person and you start talking to them about their relationship with the Lord, you know what typically we ask people is, are you a Christian? And the word Christian today has become a cliche. It means 
really nothing to a lot of people. I've actually had people pull coins out of their pocket before when I asked, are you a Christian? And they say, well, of course I'm a Christian. It says right here, in God we trust. And they think that because they have a coin that says, in God we trust, that means that they're a Christian. I've had people say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a Muslim. And since they don't believe in those other things, they by default think that they must be a Christian. I've had people acknowledge that, yeah, I believe that God exists. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and they think that that makes them a Christian. See, the word Christian has become something that is misused and abused today, and it really doesn't mean very much to people. And if you were to ask, are you a Christian, it's really uh, very subjective. It can be as simple as like the thief on the cross who just said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus told him, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. It can be that simple. This man didn't have time to grow and disciple and go through training classes. It can be as simple as just in your heart acknowledging and receiving Jesus. But it's also true that there are people who say, Lord, Lord, and they aren't truly born again. I'm going to be showing you a lot of scriptures and showing that Jesus cut through the chase. Even the man who ran and fell down at his feet and says, what must I do to be saved? Jesus recognized that he wasn't committed. And he told him, you have to sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. And then come and follow me and you'll be my disciple. Boy, if we were to do that in our churches today, there would be an uproar. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did. So I'm saying that it can be as simple as just in your heart making a heartfelt commitment. But from our perspective, looking at things, you know, God looks on the heart, and he can judge instantly whether this person really means it or not with all of their heart. That thief on the cross, he knew that he meant it, and therefore he promised him, today you're going to be with me in paradise. But when we look at a person who confesses, oh, yeah, Jesus is my Lord, we can't really evaluate, is that a heartfelt commitment, or is he just mimicking, saying something that he's been told to say? Did he repeat the prayer just to get somebody off of his back, or was he sincere? We can't see the heart of a person, but what we can do is see their actions over a period of time. So when it comes to a person saying, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I've made Jesus my Lord, that's somewhat subjective. We don't know about whether or not they have really meant that. And really, the only way you can tell is over a period of time is to look at them and see if there is a transformation. But if we were to ask, not are you a Christian, not have you been born again, but if we were to say, are you a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know what? That is something that is very easy to tell. Now, this doesn't mean that a person is perfect. It doesn't mean that they have no problems. We aren't going to be perfect until we go to be with Jesus or he comes back and takes us. But I'm saying a disciple is a person who is a learner, a follower, a person who is going on. I'm going to be showing you lots of scriptures and making these points. But I'm saying, see, that we have made the emphasis on you need to get born again and be a Christian, which being born again is absolutely essential. I am not short-selling that any at all. I believe in that 100%. But I'm saying that the Lord never told us to go and make converts. He told us to go and make disciples. Let me share this scripture with you from Matthew chapter 28. This is Jesus' last instructions to his disciples. Matter of fact, this is right as he was being caught up into heaven. In the very last words that he spoke to his disciples in verse uh, Matthew chapter 28 and in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is Jesus' last instruction. This is what's called the Great Commission. This is the directive for his disciples from that time 2,000 years ago, and it's still the directive of all of us today. What are we supposed to do? He said, go and teach all nations. This word teach I won't attempt to pronounce this Greek word here, but it literally means to be a pupil or a follower. And 10 other translations that I looked this up in, the Amplified, the NIV, and other translations, every one of them uses make disciples or disciple people. It's talking about discipleship. 
And in verse 20, it reemphasizes this and basically says this in other words. It says you have to teach them to observe all things whatsoever. In other words, the command of Jesus wasn't to go and make converts. The command of Jesus wasn't to go and get somebody just to pray a prayer and get an insurance policy so that they won't die and go to hell, but instead they would go to heaven. The Lord never told us to do that. I'm going to give you examples and show you that Jesus himself didn't minister to people that way. He went in and ministered to them and, and uh, drew people to commitment. He, like I used in Mark chapter 10, this rich young ruler, he, he looked good. He had observed all of these commandments, but he was trusting in himself instead of trusting in God. And so the Lord just wanted to show him that, you know what, you haven't obeyed all the commands. The very first command is you shall have no other gods. And he says your money is a God. What that money can do for you, the power and the influence that it gives you, that's a God. That's more important to you than me. And this man, of course, didn't acknowledge it, and so he says, well, then go sell everything you've got and give to the poor. And immediately this man was not willing to put Jesus and his commitment to Jesus ahead of his trust in his finances. And it revealed that he had broken the very first commandment, which is, you shall have no other gods before me. And so, see, Jesus ministered to people about making them disciples. It wasn't just, all right, maybe you aren't willing to commit to me completely, but are you willing to accept salvation? See, this is the way that basically, and I'm going to amplify this and show this in a lot more detail as we go through this series, but this is the basic approach that the body of Christ has taken. They have broken salvation up into parts and pieces, and they say the, the most important thing, the thing that is essential is we've got to get people to born again. And so let's just not tell them about commitment. Let's not talk about trusting God in the area of finances. Let's not preach the whole gospel. Let's not tell them about healing. Let's not tell them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's just boil it down to its simplest terms. And uh, some of them might be offended if we go to telling them that God wants them to prosper that God wants them to start giving and trusting Him in this area. They might be offended if we tell them about healing, and they may have a feeling like, well, then are you saying that it wasn't God's will that my wife, my child had to die and had to have these problems? They might be offended. So let's not talk about anything that could possibly offend them, and let's just get them to pray this prayer and get uh, born again, and then maybe later on they'll receive. Now, that could be voiced differently, but basically this is the approach that the body of Christ has had. The way that they try and uh, get into unity is that they compromise on just nearly everything. They, they look at, you know, like, well, you got to get saved. That is an essential thing. So let's not talk about anything that would divide us. Let's just come together and hold a meeting and just tell people about the basics, about that there is a heaven and a hell and you've got to accept Jesus. And they just boil it down to its simplest terms and try and get people born again. And then, whether they become a disciple, whether they are taught all things, isn't even on the radar screen of the average Christian. And if it is there, it's an afterthought and it is a minor thing and they may or may not follow through. And as a result, there is just a very, very, very small percentage of people who claim the name of the Lord who could by any interpretation be called a disciple. This is not what God has called us to do. It has hurt the individuals. It's hurt the cause of Christ as a whole. And this is what I'm beginning to deal with. And I tell you, I think that this is going to be a powerful teaching, something that could really, really help you. I'm out of time today, but I would encourage you to listen to our announcer as he gives you some information. And then join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's complete teaching titled Discipleship Evangelism is available on either CD or on DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for 13 pounds. Make sure to specify whether you want the CD or DVD series when you contact us. Or you can get today's teaching as part of the Discipleship Package. This package includes your choice of either the CD or DVD series, the Discipling Through Galatians book, the Discipling Through Romans book, and the complete Discipleship Evangelism course. These tools have been designed so that anyone, anywhere, at any time can reach an unbeliever, disciple a new believer, or grow with others in the Lord. The entire package has a catalog value of 60 pounds 50. 
But Andrew considers these resources so important, he'd like to get them to as many people as possible. Therefore, he's offering this package to you for just 45 pounds. Remember to specify the CD or DVD series when you order. I'd like to really encourage you to get these materials that we're offering. I've been making the case for how important discipleship is, and these materials were all written to disciple you and also specifically to help you disciple other people. This is our very first material that we put out nearly 20 years ago, and this has 48 lessons in it, three different levels, and it also has a CD-ROM in the front that not only can you go through and study this, but you could print out these questions and things specifically to facilitate you in ministering to other people. There are over half a million people in Uganda that have gone through this series. There are millions of people around the world that are being discipled. And then we also have discipling through Galatians and discipling through Romans. We have an entire package. Please listen and take advantage of these materials. The first audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this first CD titled The Need for Discipleship Free of Charge. We'd also like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Effortless Change for eight pounds 50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44-1922-473-300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. You do not have to motivate God to heal. God wants to heal more than you want to be healed. The almost too good to be true news you can use. www.awmi.net There's much more than just classroom activity at Karis Bible College. Students participate in hands-on ministry, like working on the ministry helpline. I'm a first-year student at CBC, and I work in the phone center full-time. I'm a second-year student at CBC, and I work full-time in the phone ministry. 90% of the volunteers in the phone center are Karis Bible College students. Thank you for calling Andrew Womack Ministries. 80% of the employees are CBC graduates. I'm a graduate of CBC last year in 2009, and I've been working in the phone center for two years. The ministry and the college are working hand in hand to deliver the gospel truth every day. We're changing lives and we're changing the world one life at a time. Mm -hmm.